So I'm here to talk about a topic, which is the reinvention of banking. Um, to use famous words, so, uh, Bill Gates said, uh, banking is needed, banks are not. So it's a very interesting comment, which is the need to make payments is there, there is a need. Whether what exists right now needs to be there is questionable. Um, so it's a very interesting space because my personal view is that everything is about timing. Um, and, I'll, and what I mean by that is when you talk about fintech, when you talk about the space that we're kind of operating in, this payment evolution, if we had had this movement 10 years ago, it would never have happened. And there are timings to kind of success stories. And one of those timings is the fact that everybody in this room is carrying a mini computer in their pocket that is far more capable than the computers that put us in space. So things are about timing. And I believe that when it comes to fintech, it's about innovation for what the customer really wants. Are the banks able to move quick enough? You know, do they really have the desire to provide that solution to the end customer? Or are they quick enough to do those things? So with that, on that topic, I want to uh, invite the panelists all to the stage. Um, I have told Pavle that it could turn into a wrestling fight. So, you know, we've asked for extra security. So, you know, just in case there's any fights between the new technology providers and some of the older ones. So could I get the panelists to join the stage, please? Well, I was going to turn into a real wrestling fight. There was a really big build up there. Um, so I'm Suresh. Um, when I'm not doing my day job, I'm actually an advisory board of the Emerging Payments Association. Uh, I also lead one of the projects, which is Project International Trade. And funnily enough, this whole conference was actually born out of a project that existed from the EPA uh, for international trade. Uh, and this is one of the a few fintech missions that have happened around the world. So I want to uh, go to the panelists and give you a short intro about what they do and uh, their company. Mike, if you start. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Mike Laven. I'm the CEO of the Currency Cloud. Uh, Currency Cloud is a cross-border payments platform. And uh, sort of the way that we look at the world is all of you or many of you and the people on the stage are involved in all sorts of kinds of innovative services in the world of fintech. And um, we provide the technology that allows those services to be cross-border. Uh, we believe that foreign exchange and payments are boring and are being commoditized and will ultimately be near free. And the real, this thing, the real issues that people have in moving money cross-border have to do with reconciliation of innovative business models, of how to connect uh, their customers and themselves, whether it's uh, payroll or receivables or trade finance, and how to make that whole world cross-border in a frictionless and seamless way. Thank you. Chen? Hi, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Zhu Chen. I think I've introduced my uh, my background uh, in, in the earlier speech. Uh, I just want to add a few words that um, uh, before before I joined Alibaba Group, I used to work for British Bank, uh, funny enough, in, uh, on the uh, foreign exchange product management. Uh, so this is, uh, and, and following that career, I joined Alipay as head of uh, financial product for international business units. So this is a subject very close to my heart, and uh, uh, it's an interesting panel. Thanks. Um, hello. My name is Vladimir Lucic. I'm CEO of uh, MTEL Montenegro uh, Telco Operator. We are part of Telecom Serbia Group. And uh, this year we implement uh, 
uh, our network of POS terminal terminals and uh, give possibility to all to all our subscriber to pay with the mobile not with uh, so our subscriber not need the card to pay in Montenegro I think this is maybe one good way how telco operator can uh, be part of this business because for example in Serbia telco operator are, are make uh, they are actually made acquisition of the banks and there are com some competitor of the banks uh, we uh, give some uh, different strategy we, we want to be partner of the banks so we implement uh, actually national uh, payment card in Montenegro uh, with the mobile so together with the banks uh, and together with the shops we made one uh, one uh, one infrastructure for all Thank you. Hello, my name is Anna, and I'm Deputy Chief Commercial Officer for Yandex Money. Yandex Money is um, the largest e-wallet in Russia. It's a Russian company, and the largest payment service provider. And also, the shareholders are Yandex, which is the internet company, IT company, bigger than Google in Russia, and Sberbank, the largest bank, which owns quite a few banks in Central and Eastern Europe as well. Hi, my name's Nick Middleton. I work for TSB. Uh, TSB is a bank that was sold by the Lloyds Banking Group to Sabadell, which is the largest, one of the largest banking groups in Spain. Um, we are a retail-focused bank with a very small SME market, and my <coughs> job within the bank is to look at strategy and design for our payments products across the wider strategic initiative. Great, thank you. So as you can see, we've got a very, we're very fortunate to have a very diverse background um, leaders from different parts of the world. So one of the questions I have, there is this movement, this fintech movement. You know, there is these early adopters. Uh, you know, it's become a real buzzword in the payment space. Now, my question is, um, is this movement, is it beneficial to the industry? How, how dependent is the, this, this specific industry dependent on fintech? You know, is it, is it looking at it with suspicion? Is it looking at it from, uh, you know, it wants to embrace it? Uh, you know, I want to get your views on this. You know, what is the real deal? Now, when we talk about fintech when it comes to end customers, yeah, you know, there is a hype and some of these brands have religious followings as per se. But in terms of as industry leaders in your space, what, do you, what role do you think fintech has in the growth of the industry? Now, I think I'm going to start with you, Nick, because, um, you know, coming from an established bank, bricks and mortar, you know, you're in that space where you have a very large customer base and you are looking at these uh, newcomers. And I can say from my early days in the payment space, they, they kind of, you know, laughed at the earlier movements. But I would love to hear, you know, your views on this. So well, what we do at TSB is we help customers save well and we help them borrow well. So we start with what is the core product offering we want to give our customers. And we, we need to, to build excellent product suites that customers will both want and need. How you then service the customer and through which channels you service them is where you need to take a, an, an omni-channel view. Laura touched on this earlier. So when people say fintech, digital, that's the way forward, that's what customers will want, I, I just go and sit in one of my branches in the northeast of England and listen to what customers really want for a day. And some of them do want to be digitally enabled and do nothing but bank online. But a lot of those customers want to know and be able to use multiple channels, uh, whether that's a branch over the telephone, on a mobile app, or sat at home on a computer. So what we do is we try and look at all of those channels and build the best possible services for our customers that way. And, and where FinTech can help us is where we want to, for example, help somebody borrow well. Traditional credit scoring that banks use is pretty awful as far as I'm concerned. Um, but you've got some fantastic fintech startups that will do new and novel ways of risk assessing a customer for credit. And I don't have professors from Cambridge and Oxford and Harvard University <coughs> on, on the books at TSB. We, we can't afford to, to pay them. But there are companies that look at new and novel ways of, for example, risk assessing a customer for an unsecured loan. 
why wouldn't I use those types of companies to help service my customers better? So I, I see it very much as a collaboration. <coughs> so you're kind of open to outsourcing and, you know? Absolutely. I mean, one of our, one of our primary corporate objectives for this year is to develop our, our SME market uh, more and better. So you know, companies like AMP and speaking to Tom would be very beneficial for a bank like TSB. You know, if we, if we tried to do that from scratch with our own internal staff as they stand now, we would never, we'd never do it. It would be far too slow. Thank you. Anna, I would love to hear what you have to say in terms of, I, I know we talked yesterday about an interesting story about one bank in Russia, but I would like to get your views. Sure. Um, in Russia, it's always, in any sphere, it's a completely different story from any other part of the world. Um, so the fintech companies, that's what actually made the whole development of e-commerce in Russia, along with um, Alibaba, I would say. Um, so the banking system was never uh, ambitious or strong in terms of uh, personal uh, money flow management or anything. It was e-wallets that appeared uh, to sustain the online business, to sustain e-commerce development. Uh, it was uh, various um, digital small companies helping people to actually pay. It was not banks. But then banks turned around and um, actually used this experience and they uh, basically became more e-wallets rather than banks. And the e-wallets, I'm just uh, talking about ours, for example, are becoming banks. So it's like a whole melting pot. The e-wallets started going to loans and um, issuing debit cards, and the banks started launching mobile apps with the whole e-wallet experiences and payments for, um, I don't know, online games or something, mm, which is a very interesting thing. So we're helping each other, I would say. Right. So, so Vladimir, I mean, uh, one of the things about yeah. telecom providers that I found very interesting is, so when it comes to the UK market, historically, the, uh, the telecom providers didn't want to enter the payment space. And, and one of the reasons for that is they didn't really want to get regulated under any way. They didn't want to fall under regulations to KYC when they were making so much money on, on pay as you go and all of these models. Now, what we've seen recently with the likes of Apple Pay and Samsung Pay, you know, Everybody wants to make money on these transactions, and we're seeing a real movement where these telecom providers or technology providers want to get a piece of the cake. So what are your views on that? Yes, uh, first of all, I, I, I can give some advice from telco business because uh, five to 10 years ago, we thought that uh, uh, we'll be destroyed uh, f uh, because of digital revolution. Uh, Telco providers are actually the first industry who, who suffered a lot because of Viber, WhatsApp, and we suddenly we not notice the, uh, the fact that uh, uh, some uh, IT companies are taking uh, almost half of our revenue. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, let's say 10 years ago, we were really traditional. We were only focused on our telco business, but right now we are really aware of the fact that we have to go to some other business businesses, otherwise we will not survive. And uh, the advantage of the mobile and the telco operators are actually that we are owner of the, of the uh, mobile customer, and uh, we know all big data about our customers. So in, in some way we have to use it uh, to, to let, let's say, to expand our revenue. And this is the reason why we uh, launch as a group in Montenegro as a test project, uh, 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 project of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, implementation of new network of POS terminals, because our strategy is not, not to acquire bank and not to fight uh, with the bank for customers, but to, uh, to be uh, on that part where we are actually experts on that processing part. Uh, and really now, if you are coming to Montenegro even as a foreign customer, you can pay only with the mobile phone. You don't need card. Uh, with this intelligent POS terminal and with the mobile phones, we are now encouraged startups to develop application on, on this platform. So uh, very soon we will implement uh, a really cheap bus transport, uh, uh, electronic bus trans uh, transport. We will, uh, for example, reservation of uh, uh, 
tickets, tickets in uh, cinema and theater. Uh, all, all smart applications will develop on this platform. Uh, so we, uh, in, in that way, we want to take this part of revenue. So it's kind of a case of adapt or yes. die. We were talked yes. about Kodak earlier on. Yes. You know, unless you adapt, there is a real danger. Yes, and uh, what, what, is the, what, are, what we are offering to banks, we said to banks, okay, we don't want to be our, uh, your competitor. We developed new national payment card. We call them pay. So implement it through Master and Visa. We will connect to your, uh, our customer to your bank account, and customer will actually pay for, with the mobile from bank account. Understand, so partnerships, yes. yeah. Chen, to the, I was going to say, the, the largest, largest startup or largest fintech in the world, to you. <laughs> um, I think uh, competition is always good for the industry because otherwise uh, you, you get replaced by other industry to, to service the, the, the demand of... Uh, what but you the Chinese need. market's particularly interesting because they've kind of leapfrogged everything that has existed before. Uh, and really embraced it. But, you know, it's like we look at China and the way that they're innovating uh, is leapfrogging everything that's anywhere else in the world. Uh, I think one, uh, one thing uh, we should take note is that uh, China don't really have the legacy uh, system that exists in a uh, in more developed part of the world. And then secondly, China uh, is a huge market in itself uh, where you can access to the market through a uh, single language, single, single legal framework, which is unusual for, for other parts of the world. Um, on, the, uh, on the other hand, I don't think uh, really the fintech has the, and the bank has really competed on the level playing field ever because the regulatory play f frameworks is different. The, the expectation of the social responsibility are different. So. Uh, but I think it's a good thing, generally, the competition will bring uh, better service and evolving uh, of the entire industry. Mike? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, what we're currently calling collaboration, we used to call sales. Um, that uh, There's a lot of very smart money that's going into a tremendous amount of innovation in financial technology at the bottom with a lot of really smart people who've come out of banks, who've come out of card schemes, who've come out of card companies who've transitioned from other parts of the industry. Um, the, the large financial institutions are, are just simply not going away. They, they have all the customers, and, and one shouldn't sit here and worry that the banks aren't going to be there. Um, but on the same hand, they have the, the classic innovator's dilemma problem, that you have to both protect your consumer and your current customer at the same time that you innovate. So what I think you'll see is the fintech world, is the world that I'm part of, um, with this tremendous amount of innovation, um, those, those pieces being, you can call it collaboration, you can call it being sold, you can call it being absorbed, but um, every bank out there has got the message that, and if you've heard it from all of the banks that are here today, that their world is digital, that their millennials are going to do it differently, that everything has to be customer centric, that the way that you're doing things is too frictionful, and all that's going to be fixed. And, and the smart banks will fix it internally and acquire financial technology from all of this innovation. The less smart banks will be eclipsed by the smarter banks. Um, the, and so what, what I see is, is that whether it's called collaboration or merging together, but, but the, the banking system will end up being the delivery channel for a lot of the innovation that we see. Um, a few fintech companies will be big and large and capture a lot of customers. But the distribution channel for a lot of this innovation will go through a traditional channel. I mean, one of the things I've kind of taken from all of you is um, that there is an element of collaboration and openness. And, and I was just thinking that if you just went back 10 years, everybody was innovating behind closed doors and nobody wanted to collaborate. People didn't want to outsource things. They wanted to have that total control. And, and I, it seems like the common trend is is that there is this openness to kind of collaborate and, and, and share benefits. So, so if I can just say the, 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 the myth that somebody owns the customer is being blown apart. And if you, I like to think of that finance was the last vertically integrated industry. And whereas in utilities we've separated distribution and devices, in mobile 
If you go back 20 years, the mobile company owned the device that was in your house. So all of that's been, been blown apart from both distribution and um, uh, to its, its various components. Finance still has that level of integration, and as that level of integration gets ripped apart, then you get lots of other pieces of innovation. So wh where you're sitting inside the bank, what you're seeing is all of those components now have people who are optimizing them, and the new configuration going forward will certainly have banks at its center, but a lot of the other pieces around the periphery could be owned by other people. I would also like to add that uh, we can see that too, the disintegration process has started and going for the financial industry, for the financial service as something separate, as some kind of like particular thing that you do, the banking, uh, it's just getting split into all the different fragments along your life. So you're in a messenger, you can send money just like a message uh, to somebody, you're on a social network, you can pay right there if you like something, let's say on Instagram. Um, and it's just this payment thing, it's not like one destination that you need to open a specific app or you need to go to a specific destination and pay, it just becomes part of the everyday life experiences. <coughs> and uh, something that we do, for example, in this respect, we are, um, there is search, Yandex search in Russia, so what we do is we enable to pay right from the search results. So if you're looking for something like, let's say, uh, top up my mobile phone account, you can do it right from the search. You don't need to open or get redirected anywhere. Uh, if you're looking for a specific movie, you can buy it right there after, after that. If you're using a navigation app and you're finding a parking spot, you found it and you pay for the parking from the navigation app. Uh, so we're kind of um, integrating these payment experiences and techniques into everyday life. I think one common theme is that it's about instant gratification. The customers want, I, I know there was the presentation earlier with Barclays um, where you know, things take, are taking longer when a customer just wants something there and then or wants to at least have a decision. So it's kind of, FinTech is filling that gap for instant gratification. But interesting on in what you said about you know, on, on, a, on a chat messenger sending payment. The question I have is, is it about convenience or is it about brand? And what I mean by that is, if tomorrow I had my own chat and it was new and it was really great technology and there was an opportunity for people to send money from one person to another, would they use it if they've never heard of me? Is the brand important? Because, you know, there are new brands with new technologies coming out, but generally the mass market operate on trust. So when we look at someone like Lloyd's TSB, it's an established... Sorry, I shouldn't say that. TSB, um, you know, it's an established bank, and you sit there and say, okay, well, my money's safe there. So if a new player comes into this space, what are your thoughts? Is, is a customer going to make a decision based on, on, on it's so great that I'm going to use this blindly, or is there trust? And, and the thing is, I'll, I'll say, could you answer this question with your hat on and the millennial's hat on? Because I know that, you know, regulation that causes friction has often been, as we evolve, has become less and less. So th there's the right degree of friction depending on the risk of the transaction. So if I'm going to pay for parking, it's much more convenient for me or a millennial to pay through an app. And if it's three quid, I really don't care if something goes wrong. You know, I can, if it doesn't work, um, and I pay three pounds twice, Am I that bothered? Uh, yeah, probably, but it, it's not that big of a risk to me. If I'm sending 10,000 pounds overseas to somebody else, would I want to do that out of my messenger app? Um, probably not. I probably want a bit more friction in that. <coughs> so you, you, depending on the, the level of risk, as the customer perceives it, will depend on how they want to pay for things. So we, we talk about frictionless and frictionful. It's, it's more friction right. What's the right level of friction for that customer for that transaction that they're executing at the time? And we've, we've talked earlier about personalizing transactions and personalizing interactions uh, using data. I think that, that's a trend that will continue as we, we understand how customers individually perceive risk and how much friction they want. Then you will create the right level of friction in those transactions for them. I think people don't really want to care about how they pay at all. They just want, like, take my money. I already confirmed I'm doing this purchase. I already told you, like, 
I, I want to transfer this payment, so just take it. They don't want to fill any forms. They don't want to do anything. They better not do anything at all. So as soon as we have, I don't know, like biometric things de all developed, and I don't know, <laughs> this huge futuristic uh, IDs in, on everyone, um, then people just wouldn't bother anymore. So we, we did a bit of a focus group with some customers who, um, when they sign up for Apple Pay and they used it once and stopped using it, we asked them why. They said, well, it's too frictionless. I'm afraid I'm going to pay for things when I don't want to. And they liked pulling a card out of their wallet and sticking it in the machine because that's what they were used to and how they knew it. Now, will that change over time as the technologies become uh, more standardized and, and have a bit of history behind them? It probably will. But with all of these things, it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. So uh, I think the most interesting thing that goes on in the world of payments is actually goes on in China, where every bright idea we have, someone in China has a billion users already doing it. But um, uh, the, the, the familiarity that people have in paying outside of WeChat, the, the massive amount of e-commerce that goes on and peer-to-peer -peer payments that go on through WeChat. In, in the US, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, it's Venmo. And um, if you were five years ago, you would talk to anybody who was under 30, and you asked how they made payments and shared them among their friends, they would have said Venmo. Well, those people are now five years older, and they're actually now sharing rent, and they're sharing $1,000 payments where they used to trust Venmo on $5 and $10 payments. They trust them on $1,000 payments, and five years from now, those people will be 40, and they'll be sharing those payments and making the payments of $10,000. So when we look at the, the future to me of payments, I think as Anna said, uh, payments are fundamentally boring. Um, they are secondary activity. Um, the activity is getting the goods and services and making them go away is what people want to do. And as the younger generation gets older and has larger financial needs, their trust in those kinds of payment um, mechanisms will, I think, transform everything. Um, we still don't have anything of the magnitude of uh, the, the way that chat payments are done in China and the way that uh, that's transformed all sorts of digital transactions. You, know, you walk into a restaurant, there's a QR code on the table. You scan the QR code, the QR code comes into your phone. You order from the phone, the bill comes to your, your, uh, your phone. I mean, there's a whole series of things that start to happen um, when you transform that payment landscape into a chat activity rather than anything else. And I think that's really the future, and it starts with young people, and it gets bigger and bigger. Yes, I just want to second that comment. I think uh, it's probably not about the brand, it's about the perception of safety. It's actually not really the real, whether it's risk-free, it's the perception. Um, and uh, I, I would, uh, give a few examples happens in China. Uh, if we talk about um, mass market wealth management uh, product, uh, we, we took a money market funds from nowhere, probably in the bottom section of the Chinese market, to today is now the world's largest money market funds because as a channel, we promote that product. So I think really, uh, as you gain trust from a customer, they will, they will gradually uh, uh, become more wealthy, as you mentioned earlier, and also they become braver. Um, and did you say they were 50th ranked initially or something? They were way down the ranks. Yes, in, in Chinese market now it's worth number one. And also every new technology takes some sort of adaptation phases. For example, I still remember when I was in London, uh, uh, when the contactless cars were introduced, there's lots of pr people uh, afraid that somebody is going to take a machine and, and get into the crowded tube <laughs> and then scam all their money away. But, but as people started using it in a daily life, those kind of worry goes away. So I think um, there are two ways to, to get a competitive advantage in these markets. One is that you have a monopoly or, or strong uh, upper hands in the product supply or capability. Uh, then you can give them all the pain in the world uh, of using it and they will still come back. Mm -hmm. And then secondly is, is that uh, you, you get to the closest layer to the consumer and wrap around them, and then everybody else will become your supplier and then you can commoditize them. Uh, and, and that's probably 
uh, uh, the, the, the probably yeah. two major games going to be playing in the industry. May I, I can also stress that brand uh, in digital is really important, and brand is equal with at least the number of visitors or number of downloads, so number of users. And uh, uh, friendly speaking, uh, uh, don't be afraid to put something new on the on digital. So because still there is a, a, a lot of room to be attractive. So maybe uh, if you want to be focused on the young population, be more creative, be more attractive. Uh, maybe uh, uh, my, I can suggest to try with some young startups to uh, to make uh, some joint project and how how to build something on the on the internet and to be more attractive for these people. Not, not more safety, but more attractive. Yeah, I, I think that probably some of the traditional banks have learned that from some of the yeah. fintechs where they've often had products in the market that aren't ready um, and people are using them and they're actually using that data to enhance the product to do, you know, uh, you know, behavior-driven development. And, and I think that the fintech space has been very, very good at that. Uh, get something out there, it may not be 100% correct, but as they get the data and the users, they're kind of enhancing the offering. Uh, and I think the fintech has been very, very strong in that space. Can I add something? <laughs> sure. Um, the, the brand is basically a person, and it's definitely all about trust. And uh, the fintech would not even be needed because I would trust Google with payments, I would trust with Apple, I would trust Facebook, I would trust whoever has a relationship with me. No any bank has this deep relationship with me than the social network that I spend several hours in. Um, so as soon as there is a clear way to just store all your funds there, I would. And uh, this is what happens. And even the payment companies like Alipay and WeChat, they are not simply payment companies. They're a lifestyle. Mm. They're a lifestyle. They're enriching themselves. They are doing the relationship. They're in every single point of life with a person. And that's because the relationship will do it, not the product even itself. Understood. I actually want to ask some questions to the audience because I want to get some views. Um, you know, do people agree with these comments? Do they disagree? Have they got some questions? I, I want to get some feedback from the audience. Does anybody have any comments to add? Not everybody at the same time, guys. Is, I can't see you all. <laughs> anybody? Lana. We have two on the same table. If you ask a difficult question, Lana, we're not going to answer it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So I just wanted to ask, can somebody trust Google or Facebook to take a mortgage of a half a million pounds to buy a house in London? Absolutely. Well, if, if we take the percentage, 71% of millennials get their financial advice from their parents and grandparents, they probably wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> so... Um, I don't know. I, I, I certainly wouldn't recommend it to my kids. Um, I'd recommend they go to a bank. But, you know, when they're older, in 10, 15, 20 years' time, and they have kids, maybe they'll recommend it. Thanks. Uh, I, I think uh, my personal experience is that when I was younger, um, the, the most shining and, and, and beautiful building on the street is, is the bank branch because they always take the prime spot on, 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 on the street. I, I guess it's probably uh, on purpose to give you a sense of trust because these people are wealthy so you can trust your money with them. And, and nowadays people don't really go to, to the offline shops to shop anymore. Um, they interact more uh, socially and economically with the uh, uh, e-commerce or fintech companies. So uh, I would have not too much problem imagining one day Google will become a significant distribution channel for financial products, including the mortgage. But would, would they be the ones that offer the product, do you think, Chen? Or would it be uh, the bank? Not necessarily, as I said, uh, because mortgage is, is not a, a monopoly product. So as long as they have the customers, they can use, I don't know, 10 different banks, each shipping 10% to, to assemble their mortgage. Could be. And I'm just wondering, do you think 
the environment where it, recently the banks have had a real bashing in the UK uh, in terms of, you know, do you trust the banks? Do you think that's, that environment has kind of added to people saying, I want to look at an alternative? You know, I, I'd rather trust Google than a traditional bank? So, so um, uh, we, at Currency Cloud, we deal with, not all, but many of the challenger banks in the UK and certainly a lot of the prepaid cards that are substituting for it. And the question that you have to ask of all of those institutions is, are people putting their salary into it? And until people trust them to put their salary into it, then all of the cards and all of the challenger banks are just toys. They're, they're used for budgeting, they're used for cross-border, and both in Germany, remember the uh, company Nicole in France has been acquired by BNP. Uh, number 26 had a whole um, program to try and get people to put their salary in. I don't know if that worked out that well. So those tend to be not, th that's the level of trust that you have to have. There, there's one other issue that I thought that is important that we haven't talked about. Um, that it's a question of whether, even if you trust the bank w with your money, will you trust them with your data? And to the extent that whether it's um, Alipay in all of, its, all of its manifestations and Google and all of its manifestations know everything about me and have all of my data, um, the question is, do I really want that? And, and I think one of the things that we're going to transform from is I might trust you to have my money, but I'm gonna, am I'm, do I trust you to know everything about me and everything about my life? And I think there's a role for regulation. We haven't talked about regulation at all. And you could also have a whole conference about plus or minuses of regulation. But um, one of the things I am really quite concerned about is who owns the data and who owns all the data about me. And I'm actually more concerned about that than who owns my money. My 20-year-old isn't. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. On, the, on that data topic, I, I was going to say that what I found is that people are concerned if that data is being passed somewhere else. But if they are being provided services that are relevant to you, that are targeted to you. So I'll give you an example. Some of our clients that, in my day job um, that we provide data to for transactions, they are, the, the new challenger banks are providing like a learning bank. So they're sitting there saying, ah, they've got life insurance and every month they pay you know, this for their life insurance or their utility bill. Now, they know that they live in a three-bedroom house in this region, and they're saying, you're actually paying above average for your gas electricity bill, and here's a list of providers that could save you money. So, they're, 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 and, and we're seeing customers that are switching to these providers because they see the benefit on having a clever bank provide a bespoke solution to them. Bespoke's the wrong term, but they, they're giving them tailored information that they see beneficial. Yeah, some people will love it, some people will hate it, and it's figuring out how you target the right group of customers. Sorry, there was a second question there. That's okay. Hi. I don't know if my, the microphone works. Actually, I had one question, but Mike, you opened it up for me. In the next panel, I, I'm going to talk lots about reg because that's pretty much all I know. <laughs> but, but I think equally in, those same, in that same vein, the one thing I haven't heard anybody talk about is bartering. And, and I probably... I don't do any peer-to-peer -peer payments. If, if, I owe, if I owe Lana 10 pounds, I'll just say, actually, you know what? The next dinner's on me. Or <laughs> let's go have dinner here, or let's go have a coffee here. So I do a lot more bartering than I do peer-to-peer -peer payments. Um, and, I, and I don't know if that's because of regulation or because of trust or personal preference. But I do think <coughs> that I, I'd be curious to see how, what, what, what you five think about that sort of, those sort of transactions. I guess not transactions, but relationships when we move more towards a transactional type environment for, for payments. So, so when you talk to anybody in the U.S. under, as I said, under 35, and ask them how they make most of their payments, they'll answer Venmo. And when you sit in a group of banks in the U.S., you go to the NACHA conference, and you have all of the middle class banks, and you ask them what do they worry about, they don't worry about faster payments, they don't worry about cross-border payments, they worry about Venmo. And for a bunch of regulatory reasons, that kind of peer-to-peer hasn't taken off to that extent in Europe. No, not, let's not even think about cross-border. Let's just think about within individual currencies and individual countries. Um, we haven't seen that, that dynamic in Europe. And there's certainly lots of experiments. I mean, there's sorts of lots to peer, but there's nothing that approaches Venmo. And, and then remember, the, the banks in the US have then responded with a consortium of 11 banks that has something called Zelle, 
which is not taken off yet, but that's only because it's just started. Um, again, you have the Chinese environment. So I think that, that I mean, uh, we may buy each other our friends the next dinner, but I think that people under 35 don't do that. They share it on Venmo. Thank you. So I've got one question that I would like to ask you guys, um, and it's, I sometimes refer it to as the elephant in the room, which is, Fintech, is it, is it a hype? You know, is this bubble going to burst? You know, is it, you know, we can all sit there and say, this is, this is amazing, it's brilliant, and then some people say, yes, but is it making revenue? Is it going to, you know, is this bubble going to burst? So what I would like to get your views on is, is Fintech a hype? You know, is it all hype? Is it all smoke and mirrors? Um, and, 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 and if it is hype and something does go wrong, what are the consequences to the industry? I should just drop the mic and leave the stage. I think it's, you'll probably be similar to the dot-com boom we had back in the late 90s, early 90s. You know, there'll be winners and losers out of that and the way we interact uh, with each other and with people that provide goods and services, whether they're financial or physical or otherwise, will change. Um, will we have 500 new FinTech companies that are all winning? No, we'll probably have five or 10 you know, very similar to what we had in uh, that, that boom of the early 90s. So you think the trust will still be there? So if a few of the fintechs go under or something, they would still, the consumers will still embrace the others? Or do you think they would go running and say, I need to put all my money in traditional banks because I'm concerned? Well, customers still know they're protected. I mean, in the UK market, uh, it keeps changing, but somewhere between 75 and 85,000 pounds you deposit is protected. So, you know, most people don't have that much money, so they feel comfortable that if something does go wrong, they're going to get it back one way or another. Um, so they, they might use fintechs initially as channels and to do things like personal financial management and split payments and buy things in restaurants and split the bill. But they're going to want the, initially at least, the, the, the knowledge that that's underpinned by a heavily regulated, secure and insured financial institution. Um, but in 10 years' time, that might change. Anna? Sorry. Um, the fintech only appeared when smartphones appeared and the internet appeared and all these uh, new things appeared. So it, it was driven by technology. Um, and the reason is that the, the banks were um, this kind of huge system, not in all countries, but still. Um, and it, it used to be and is right now a thing of a past, I would say because the technology changes, we have more speed, we have a completely different way of how we live now. And the fintech companies, they only cover the, the weak spots that the, the previous financial uh, ecosystem had. It covers that, so as soon as the technology develops further, maybe this won't be those fintech companies that we now have, because it would be something else, the new reality. Uh, f f fintech is something that uh Without it, you cannot survive in the future. Because usually now, these uh, uh, technology things, people are connected with the mobile phones and smartphones. But be aware of the fact that new revolution will come through virtual reality. And virtual reality will completely change mind of, of people, young people. So without accessing to, to, to new technology, developing uh, an application, through application, some connection with the customer, uh, when virtual reality will come on the market, it's for two, three years, uh, everything will change. Even many of the players now on the mobile internet maybe will not survive this. So it's, it's completely changed. Hmm. I, I think um, generous, uh, it's difficult to generalize this, this question. Um, I believe that by the end of the day, uh, whether a company would exist uh, by and large based on the, uh, the, um, the service that, whether the service they're providing to their customer is re irreplaceable um, and, and customer to extend that somebody is willing to write a check with. Um, during the uh, due diligence uh, uh, projects have come, gone through in the past few years, I do see some insane valuations of, of tech companies. Um, I can see partially driven by the fear of losing out by some of the investments, uh, investors, 
and partially driven by the greed uh, that has been motivated by uh, the low interest rate environment that we're experiencing. So I guess um, in the long run, uh, FinTech uh, will survive and there will be people dropping out um, as we're experiencing a uh, more savvy investor and a higher interest rate environment the valuation is probably going to be more realistic rather than uh, than uh, imaginary. So. Um, <clears throat> uh, innovation always starts at the bottom. And it starts with people in their personal life uh, doing things that have nothing to do with work. Um, it happened with PCs, it happens with smartphones, and then those things creep into the business environment and transform business. And so, as Anna says, um, now we st start to see the, smart form, the smartphone transforming financial technology and our financial interactions, both as a business or as an individual. And I think that's unstoppable. Whether, the, whether because in your personal life and in the personal life of the next generation, that's been transformed, it'll transform your business life. Whether the ultimately delivery channel for that will be an independent company, a few will survive, most won't or it'll be the traditional owners of the financial channels, the big card companies, the big processors, and the big banks. It'll be some mix of that. But, but the concept that um, the delivery of finance has been transformed by a user transformation of smartphones is it's here to stay, it's unstoppable. So if, in, in the sense, that, that part of FinTech will absolutely continue. Which companies will be winners and losers? Don't ask me, but, but, but the actual transformation of FinTech is unstoppable. Thank you. I've been told we're out of time now, and apparently Tony has some very exciting news, so he needs to run on stage and say something. So I would like to give a hand to our panelists here. Thank you.